Good morning. Are starting a brand new series, and we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph. And we're going to be in Genesis. So we're starting in Genesis chapter 37, and there's just some really powerful things that we see through the life of Joseph as we go through this that God wants to speak. They're true in our lives as well today. And so uh, get ready. God's going to do some good things as we do this. So uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different things, cover a lot of different ground as we see what happens happens in the life of Joseph, but this morning, I would imagine that each of us, all of us, maybe, you know, we're here today, I would say that all of us have dreamed at one point or another in our lives. We've had these dreams for our lives, and we may have dreamt about things like being successful in business, or successful in sports, or even successful in parenting, or even education, having success in our education, but whatever that dream was or is, let me say we shouldn't give up on our dreams, especially, especially, especially if that dream is from God. Don't give up on that dream. And so this morning, like I said, we're going to be starting to look at the life of Joseph, and he's a man who literally dreamed for God Almighty, and he's a, a man who he attained those dreams that he had in his lifetime. He saw them come through, and I'm convinced that God plants within each of his followers, each of his children, a dream, a task. There's a task that God has created us to do. He's created you for something in, to do. There's a purpose specifically designed for you to fulfill. And it's exciting when you discover what that dream is. But let me tell you here this morning, sometimes when we take that first step towards that dream that God has given us, let me, you may encounter a delay. Things might slow that down or even look like it stops it. And if it's a God-given dream, you're going to face obstacles, you're going to face detours, and sometimes you're going to see some look things that look like dead ends. Sometimes you may be so far away from that dream that you're going to call yourself a fool forever believing that this thing was even possible. That happens. But it's in those moments that we have to remember that these delays are all a part of the plan of God for our lives, that he is working in the midst of those situations. And, and I love to look at the lives of those people who were alive during the writing of the Old Testament. God gives some of these, you know, he shows us and uses some of these lives of these people in the Old Testament to, to teach us, to encourage us, and sometimes he uses them to to warn us, and we see these here, and there's some certain Old Testament personalities that as we read the Old Testament, they call for a closer look, and I think Joseph is one of these people, but there are stories that, that, I, that we should hand down to our children and our grandchildren of what God has done in these lives of people, and we draw on these stories to gain insight into uh, how to live by faith and learn to to trust God when life seems like it's about to overwhelm us. We can see God in the midst of it because we see God and how he worked in the lives of these people. And so we learn from studying these lives that God is on our side, but he longs for and he expects us to be in this process that we go through in our lives because he's working to mature us and bring us to the point where we need to be so we can do what God has called us to do, all right? And so God has always been about calling people who will be holy, who will live a life of holiness, and it's through the power of God and what God has done for us through Christ Jesus that makes us holy, but to follow him and to live in this world but take their cues in life from another world, right? Heaven. And the people God has called who will live in this world but not necessarily be of this world. And we hear this call of God in our lives and, and live the, the kingdom principles for his kingdom. And we align our lives with his kingdom and our priorities and our relationships according to God's will and God's ways. And this is what God has called us to do. 
And to fully understand here what we're going to get into with the life of Joseph, we need to have a little background before we dig into Genesis 37 here this morning. We have to just understand some things that are happening in the life of this family, of Joseph's. The home of Joseph was anything but a place of shelter. It wasn't. And this is really where the storms of Joseph's life begin, are in the home. And in Joseph's life, the first person that we need to look at and see is his father. His name is Jacob, and God renames Jacob to Israel, which means God strives. And it's God named him that after Jacob had wrestled with God until, and he held on to God until he was blessed by God. And this is a much better name, Israel, than what his birth name was of Jacob, because Jacob means chiseler or deceiver. And it's amazing how well Jacob lived up to his original name, his birth name of deceiver. He cheated and he lied his way through most of his life. There were few instances where he showed godliness in his life, but they were not the norm. They were few and far between. And Jacob not only married one girl, but he married two, and this also brought trouble to the family because he had two wives, and they were sisters, Leah and Rachel, and of the two wives, Rachel was the one he loved. He kind of got swindled into the other by his father-in-law, another deceiver, I guess, we have here. But because Jacob loved Rachel more than he did Leah, it set up this rivalry between the two of them, and this rivalry ended up being a competition of who can give Jacob the most children. Leah gave him seven children. And Rachel, she was barren. She was not able to give him any children. And at that time uh, of this writing, when they lived, being barren was looked upon as being a curse. And so Rachel, because of this, gave Jacob her maid so that he could have children with her maid. And he ended up having two children with her maid named Billa. And not to be outdone, Leah does the same thing. Gives Jacob her maid, and he has children with her. Two more. After all of this, it tells us in Genesis chapter 30 that God remembered Rachel and opened her womb, and now and then she had children, two more children, or two children. So this, these are all these kids that, that Jacob has. But in all of this story here and all that's happening with all these kids, there's all this fighting between the two sisters. And in all of the family troubles and all of the problems that were going on and all the things that Jacob's children caused that were wrong, he never did anything about it. He didn't try to stop it. He didn't try to correct it. He didn't do anything. All that Jacob cared about was that his name would look good in the community that he happened to be living in. So this gives us a little bit of a backstory of what's happening and brings us to Genesis chapter 37, and we see all this turmoil that's in the family. So if you have your Bibles open, let's look at Genesis chapter 37, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read down through verse 4. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilna and Zilpah. Those were the two maids, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, to their father, or of them to their father. Excuse me. Verse 3 says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So this brings up some important issues that we see here in this, in their, in this family. All right, We see Joseph here, he goes back to his father, and he gives some sort of report about the rest of his brothers. And whether Joseph was being a faithful servant to just report to his father of what was going out there in the fields, or he was just being a tattletale, we don't really know. But we do know that his brothers saw it as a sign of him being a tattletale. Nobody 
Nobody likes a tattletale, right? Nobody does. But this is what he did. And so it tells us there that they hated him for this. They couldn't even speak a kind or a peaceful word to him after all of this, right? And then that tells us here in this passage that Jacob loved him the most. Of all of the sons, he loved Joseph the most. And he makes him this multicolored tunic or a coat of many colors. And because of this multicolors, it was seen as a robe of distinction, like it set him apart. And the brothers assumed that this meant that Joseph would take the family leadership. Joseph was the 10th son. He was the first son of his favorite wife, but he's the tenth son. Not the first. That's where it usually went to. And so this robe, this tunic that Jacob gave Joseph, it was one of multicolors, of course, but it went all the way down to his hands and all the way down to his feet. It was a full-length robe. And Joseph's brothers were shepherds of the family flock. And the clothing that you would wear to take care and be a shepherd would be these short sleeves, uh, like knee-length tunics. They weren't long sleeve, long arms. And so when Joseph was given this full-length, multicolored tunic, his brothers realized that, hey, Joseph doesn't have to do the same work that we all have to do. And we can't miss, again, this closing statement in verse 4. We're told that his brothers saw all this, that their dad loved Joseph the most, and they couldn't speak a kind word to him. Whenever they saw him, they couldn't even say one nice thing. And then say the situation gets, seems to get worse. The storm in the family gets bigger and bigger, and Jacob, being the head of the family, does nothing about it to try to stop this situation. He allows all these things to happen, and he doesn't take care of any of it. Let's look at verse 5, Genesis 37. It said, Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to are, are you indeed to rule over us? Excuse me. And so they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. And then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I've had I've dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept, kept the saying in mind. And so through all of these family struggles of Jacob's here and of Joseph's and all of this, this whole family thing that's happening here, we actually are going to see that God leads in the midst of all of this. He leads through all this. He brings especially Joseph through all of these struggles that we're going to see. And so what does God do? Well, God, how does he bring us through those hardships? God prepares us for the future. He does. This is what God does. God gave Joseph dreams of what his future was going to look like so that it would help him get through the hard times that he was about to face in his life. And we find strength and encouragement from the Word of God. When we read the Bible, there is strength, there is encouragement that, that comes into our lives to, to help us. It's a light for our path to lead us. And other times, preparation comes and, and help comes from a timely word from another follower of Jesus, right, where they just gives us something to help us in that situation. Or it's from reassurance from the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, that I'm with you. This is what God called you to do. And so after Joseph tells his family these dreams that he's had, it makes his brothers hate him all the more. And we need to remember that whatever we're going through, Whatever it is that we're facing, God will prepare us for it. 
He will prepare us for it. And you may say, well, I'm going through some stuff right now. I don't feel that really that prepared for it. Trust me, God has prepared you for it. He has already worked in your life. He is not going to leave you in the midst of it either. He is going to walk you through this situation. He'll lead you through whatever it is that you face. This is the hope that we need to hold on to, that we need to have when we are going through difficult times. That God has prepared us, and he will walk us through this situation. We all need hope in our lives to make it through those hard times. And it was Jesus' hope that led him and helped him go and get through the agony of the crucifixion. We see this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. We can never let go of our hope. We can never let go of that because we are going to need it in our lives. We've got to know and we've got to trust Jesus with whatever is happening in our lives. And one of the greatest deceptions that Satan wants us to believe as followers of Jesus, as Christians, is to have this belief that if you just give your life to God, then everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be smooth in your life. You're not going to have any more real problems. And there have been a lot of people who have thought that and given their lives to Jesus, and as soon as something Something hard hits, they don't know what to do. My life wasn't supposed to be this way. My life was supposed to be good. And then they let go of their hope. They assume God's not able because God didn't do anything to change the situation in my life. And so when that happens, there's, there's a starting to abandon the faith and the hope that they have in God. You see, our hope is not that everything is always going to be okay and going to be great in our lives. Our hope is, is that no matter what happens, God is still at work and God has a purpose for good in our lives. He can turn it around. And so Joseph had this great looking future. He had all this ahead of him, these dreams that God had given him. And even though his brothers had put him down, whenever they got the chance, they hated him and they, they couldn't even speak a kind word to him, it did not keep Joseph from being determined to make something of his life and to go with what God had called him to do. And so there was this hope that was inside of him that others could not destroy, no matter what was happening in his family. And his brother's anger, dislike, prejudice, and the actions they had toward him were not able to, able to stifle that hope that he had to reach the potential that God had for him to do what God had called him to do. And we need to hold on to the hope of God no matter what we see before us and see God bring us to that potential that he has for us. Joseph it tells us here in this passage that Joseph then is sent by his father to visit his brothers as they're out in the fields tending the flocks. And it tells us in, the, in Genesis 37 that when his brothers see him coming to them, they hate him even more. It says in verse 19, if you have your Bibles open, they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see what will become of his dreams. This could have been the death to the hope that he had in God, right? His brothers are ready to kill him. They have all this hostility here that's happening in this family. I mean, think about it. They, they instantly see him. As soon as they see him, they want to kill him. They want to get rid of this guy. That's their immediate reaction. And it was said with anger, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. But then they talk about it a little more, Genesis 37 tells us, and they say, you know, let's just leave him here in the pit to die. That way we don't actually have to kill him. He'll just die on his own. 
And that kind of came up with the eldest brother there, Reuben, and because he was thinking to himself he would come back later and let Joseph out. But all while, while they're discussing it, it tells us here that the brothers saw a group of slave traders coming by. They were on their way to Egypt, and so the brothers discussed it amongst themselves, and they said, look, why should we kill him and get nothing out of it? After all, he is our brother. It's kind of an interesting way of saying it, right? Let's not kill him and get nothing out of it. He's our brother. We should get something from him, right? He's our own flesh and blood. And so they sell him to these slave traders on their way to Egypt, and they split the money. They get about a half a pound of silver for their brother. And then they poured out some blood onto that multicolored tunic, that coat of many colors, and they take it back to their father, and they ask their father, Jacob, to take a look at this and see if, they know, if he knows who it belonged to. And when he sees this, he goes into mourning because he believed a wild animal has destroyed and devoured his son. And he couldn't help but think, if I hadn't sent him out to my other sons, he'd still be alive. How could this, this never should have happened, is what Jacob begins to think. And here's Joseph now, on the road to Egypt, a slave, and he must be thinking to himself, and having maybe even just for a little bit his hope waver in this moment, thinking, this isn't turning out right, God. This isn't the way it was supposed to be. I'm just doing what you've asked me to do. Why, why am I a, a slave now? We could hardly blame Joseph if he'd just given up on his dreams at that moment. Surrendered his life in just as a despair because there's no hope now. But don't ever forget, just because things aren't going the way you want them to go, doesn't mean that God has not that God has stopped working in your situation and in your life. God can use the evil, the brutality, the hatred, the sin of injustice that others bring, and he can use all that to get you to the place that he needs you to be. He can use all that for good. Even though it's meant in horribleness and wrong and evil, he can turn it for good. And so Joseph went all of, through all of this because God needed somebody in Egypt, somebody that would listen to him he needed in Egypt. And so Joseph had a hope that God was going to elevate him in his life. He just didn't understand that, that sometimes God has to do all these things before he can fully raise us up to where he needs us to be. Sometimes we've got to be down in the pit and look up for deliverance. Make sure we're trusting in him. And from the outside, it looked as though Joseph was, was making this journey all by himself. He's all alone. But notice, no follower of Jesus is ever truly alone. Because God has promised us, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And sometimes God uses a change of circumstances to help push us to get us to a higher place of spiritual growth in our lives, that we connect with him in a way we would have never connected with him ever before. In fact, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of this affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but this was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. It's not by my strength, but it's by God's strength who can raise the dead. And do you see that this morning in your life? Do you recognize that no matter where you are in your life, whether it's good or bad, God has the power to do whatever you need. Let that build your faith this morning. Let that strengthen your hope today. God is able to raise the dead, and that is his strength. Yes. He he is our hope. Amen. Amen. Another thing we see here, how does God lead us through hardships? Well, God will make us, he'll lead us to make that choice to forgive. This is a hard one. Some things should be forgotten. Joseph could have wasted his life dwelling on all of the injustices that he suffered throughout his life. We're just seeing one of them that's going to happen in his life here. 
So far, his brothers have sold him into slavery. He's now being forced to live in a hostile land. He's being taken away from his family, his father. And we know that Joseph is going to face way more troubles than this here in his life. But in spite of all that he endured, he didn't stay in unforgiveness. And you say, how do you know that? Well, you read a little farther down the way. You see, later on in his life, he names one of his children Manasseh. Manasseh means, for God has made me forget. In our lives, we're going to face troubles, hardships. We're going to experience also many joys in our lives. Uh, joys for me are times when I get to, you know, walk, go on walks and hikes with my family, uh, playing some golf or skiing, uh, having coffee and, and, and laughing with all of you. Those kind of things are joys for me, going fishing. I'm sure God gave, gave you, has, you know, you've got joys in your life, too, that you can talk about. But on the other side of all of that, we all face troubles. We all have hardships and pains we go through. And some of those come as a result of sin. Some come from other people, whether they meant to cause us that pain or they didn't mean to cause us that pain. It's done by accident. And when others cause us pain, for whatever reason it may be, we have a choice on how we're going to deal with that pain. How are we going to deal with it? And it seems to be that Joseph made a choice on that journey from being sold as a slave and before he got into Egypt that he was going to forgive his brothers. He had to have purposed in his heart that he was going to forgive them just as Daniel had purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself when he went to Babylon. And we need to make the same choice as believers to forgive in our lives. And yes, there are some things that need to be dropped from our memory. And we shouldn't harbor wrongs that have been done to us. And maybe there's been some unkind word that's happened in our life or something that's happened, and we need to just let some of those things go so that we can mature in Christ. Because the longer we hold on to those things, it stunts our maturity. And we've got to let those things go and forget those so that we can grow in what God has has for us. We should never allow someone else's insensitivity and use that as an excuse for not serving God. Let me ask you this morning, are there things in your life, in your past, that you need to forgive and forget? Are there some things in your life? It's far better to forgive than to resent and hold on to those things. We have to remember, though, that we do sometimes need to set up some boundaries when we've been hurt so that we don't get hurt again, but we can forgive. We can forgive. We can let go of those hurts. And so we need to deal with our attitudes just as harshly as we do with our actions. The actions are the things we see, and a lot of times we deal with those really harshly, and we try to get rid of those wrong actions in our lives, but we need to also get rid of those same attitudes that are wrong. We need to come down hard on those wrong attitudes. Jealousy and hatred, those things never correct themselves, let me tell you. They only actually lead to greater wrongs. And when we face jealousy and anger, we need to pray. There isn't any more action or any other action that's more powerful than prayer. We need to pray. And I realize that this biblical account here of Joseph's life doesn't tell us that as he's on his way that he prayed. But how could he just forgive and forget his brothers, what they've done to him, if he hadn't prayed? I don't think he could have done it without prayer. How else could he have this hope in his life? And you see, what prayer does... It gives us the power to endure and to forgive. And I believe at this point in Joseph's life, it turned his life around and he turned this situation over to God because he's got nothing else other than God at this moment. It's just him and God on the way to Egypt. And surely, even at the age of 17, his only hope was in God. He knew then that his only hope was God. And Joseph has only begun to experience life's dark and mysterious events that he's going to face. But through all of these things that goes on in his life, he is going to see the hand of God 
God is going to be with him, and ultimately he can trace God's sovereign plan through all of this here. And so this morning, we need to understand that maturity is not a gift, okay? It's not something we just get. You can't rush maturity. You can't buy maturity. Maturity is not even inherited, okay? And so like Joseph, you could dream these dreams, but reading these dreams and reading pe people and situations is a different matter. And Joseph maybe didn't have maturity at that point to deal with these dreams in the right way. He knew he was going to trust God, and he knew God had a plan, but he didn't always deal with them the right way. And so this morning, this, I want to just ask some questions as we close. I'm going to have the questions up here on the screen, and so we can look at these here. But as we've looked at this first part of Joseph's life, we need to ask ourselves some questions. And the first one is, if there's trouble, strife, or misunderstanding, have you been a part of the problem, or have you been part of the solution? Where have you been in that? Did you help or did you hinder? Did you help or did you hinder? What does it take for you to mend fences, to build bridges, and to smooth feathers in situations in your life? God may be asking you to do some things to fix some of this and help to bring healing in those situations. And another question is, is do obstacles, problems, and difficulties do they sink you, or do they mature you in spiritual growth? This is really what God wants to do, is when we go through these things, He doesn't want us to sink, He doesn't want us to run away, He wants us to dig in to Him and go near Him and draw near Him, and He will draw near to us and grow us in maturity. And then the last one here, do you believe God confidently, cheerfully, and continuously through the long, winding, and uneven paths of life? No matter what happens, do you trust in Him? Do you hope in Him? Will you let God direct your life, your steps? And these are the questions I want us to think about as we close here this morning, as the musicians come up here this as we close. I want you just to take a moment to think about these things. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking into your life right here this morning, leading you in one of these. Maybe he's just telling you right now that you need to do something. Act upon it today. Say, God, with your strength, I want to do this. We take this into prayer, and don't we just leave these, these questions up for a while, and then maybe halfway through the song you can put the lyrics on, and we'll all enter in and worship with our, our worship team here this morning. But we take some time to pray about these, and I'll come and close us here in just a moment.